So, Mamir, why did Freya spin your face? No. Speak of Baldur. He claims nothing harms him. Aye, Baldur is blessed with invulnerability to all threats, physical or magical. The boasting of a god. Everyone has a weakness. Not him, I'm afraid. Baldur is blessed with invulnerability to all threats, physical or magical. You just said that, Mimir. Did I? What is the source of this power? Well, as I recall, it involved, uh, a spell? Mimir? Parts of my brain must still be coming back to life. Just need a moment to finish waking up. I hope he's not broken. Mimir, you never did tell me why Freya spit in your face. Well, she blames me in large measure for her present circumstances, and not totally without reason. It all goes back to the long war between the Aesir and Vanir. Prior to that, wars for the Aesir were easily won, but the Vanir had proved their equal and exacted devastating damage. Both sides suffered tremendous losses, and for many of us, quite frankly, war was simply no fun anymore, but a rather senseless waste of precious life. Wouldn't you agree, brother? <sighs> Precisely. Enough was enough. And at last, Odin's most brilliant advisor became determined to find a more enlightened path. He set about to broker a peace between the gods. It took some convincing, but ultimately Odin was persuaded to marry his deadliest enemy, a certain Vanir goddess, legendary not only for her fertile beauty, but her genius at the very Vanir magic that Odin had long aspired to master. Freya married Odin? What was in it for her? It was a sacrifice to protect her people. A selfless act of love. Truly, she deserves better than she got. But of course, there's more to that story. Why don't you tell me how all this began with Boulder? He just knocked on our door. Boulder of Asgard just knocked on your door? Yeah. He just showed up and started a fight. He said he wanted to know something. He said, I know what you are. <sighs> oh, well, we'll circle back to that later. What exactly did he want to know? I was under the floor by then. He said I already knew what he wanted. Perhaps he mistook me for another. Yeah, that's quite interesting. A mystic's gentle breeze and the sweet smell of honeysuckle and blood. Well, judging by the sky, the Light Elves are in control of the light this time. Explain. You see, the Light Elves and Dark Elves... ...are always fighting over the light. That part we know. But did you also know that control of the light has changed hands no less than 213 times? Really? It's true. Each side believes itself the rightful keepers of the light, and argue they're simply fighting for survival. But the fact of the matter is, the war has been going on so long, they don't know who they are without it. Look this up for me. Fadolfai means... Land of the Dark Elves. Right? Right. But you said the Dark Elves have been here now for a really long time. And anyway, aren't dwarves supposed to be from Svartalfheim? They don't look like Dark Elves. Don't you think so? Then you are vastly more perceptive than the Aesir. They're the ones who apparently can't tell the difference. And they're the ones who came up with that name. Dwarves actually call their home realm Nidavlia. So the Dark Elves aren't from Svartalfheim at all? Not even a bit. They're just elves of another colour. Nobody knows who came first, but they all come from Alfheim. Why do they fight all the time if they're really the same? That is adorable. Huh? It is the way of the world. Oh. Well, that's sad. Freya's Temple. The ring is just as beautiful as I'd remembered. Freya. 
A Vanir god. Freya's brother, actually. Freya has a long history with the elves. One of the few gods welcome here. Boy. Yes, sir. Okay. That's going in the journal. Father, after what we did, giving control of the temple back to the Light Ops, do you think the war is over? At least, for a while? No, Atreus. The Dark Elves may have scattered for now, but some other will rise to lead them, and they will surely attack again. Fredia does right, son. I see. Here. Boy. Hmm. This giant's a sorceress. Her name is Groa. Groa, the Knowledge Keeper. Looks like she had visions. Aye. As an augur, she was unsurpassed. Did Odin kill her for her book? Oh, remind me to tell you that story. Who are those two men with bodies? Are they really the sons of Thor? Aye, Magni and Modi. Two bigger twits you won't likely find in the halls of Asgard. They'll do anything their uncle puts them up to. They are fools. Well, dangerous fools, to be sure. When they work together, they're formidable. But too often it's a petty competition. Terribly strong, even as children. I remember the time Grimnir the Brawler fell upon Thor. Another time, Ed. I can't believe Odin and Freya were ever married. Love and hate are more closely intertwined than you might imagine. For instance, Odin hates the giants and they him. But Thor's own mother was the giantess Fjorgun, one of Odin's great loves. So Thor's half god and half giant? Weird. Once Fjorgun was gone, lonely ages passed for Odin. And as war with the Vanir raged, I could see what he really wanted beneath his bluster. And after no small amount of convincing, Freya agreed. For a while there, he really turned on the charm. He seemed happy. He seemed interested in making her happy. He granted her so many wishes, I can scarcely recall them all. The peace held, and I truly believed all had worked out better than I could have planned. But Odin's true face showed itself again in the end. Oh, he won Freya's trust, and she taught him some of her Vanir magic, another choice she would live to bitterly regret. Sadly, despite his wise counselor's best efforts to persuade him that peace was the only true path to stave off Ragnarok, Odin never let go of his obsession with Jotunheim. The taste of Vanir magic led him to new forms of experimentation and new levels of depravity. Okay, obviously the marriage to Odin didn't last, but... How did Freya end up a hermit in the woods? Oh, that was a singular piece of cruelty, even for Odin. As if the marriage wasn't punishment enough. Freya was better to him than he deserved. She stuck it out through all manner of indignity, all in the name of maintaining peace and safety for her people. But Odin's madness, his tyranny, his corruption of her magics, it became more than she could stomach, and at long last she broke it off. Odin's wrath was fierce, and his curses upon her were more than she dared to fear. But her magic was so much stronger than his. After so much time together, he knew her vulnerabilities, and exploited them to craft curses she could never break. Oh, like not being able to leave Midgard. Worse still, he robbed her of her warrior spirit. Freya cannot fight, even to defend herself. No living thing may she harm by blade nor spell. In a world this belligerent, what choice does she have but isolation? Poor Freya. I guess if I was her, 
I'd spit in your face too. I lied. So would I. The mirror. There was a shrine about a giant lady with lots of books and, and visions. Ah, that would be Groa, the knowledge keeper. She was a gifted sorceress who gathered every tome of arcane wisdom she could find in the realms, all in the hopes of augmenting her powers of prophecy that she might find her lost husband, Arvandil. But it was not her husband she would glimpse in her visions, for it was Groa, seeing longer and farther than any before or since, who witnessed Ragnarok, the end and the beginning. When Odin caught word of her ultimate prophecy, he maneuvered to obtain her knowledge and hoard it for himself. Groa knew Odin as a long-time patron of her services, and so she welcomed him into her library as a friend. What she did not know is that Odin himself was behind her husband's disappearance, having used his enchantments to conceal his death at Thor's hands from her sight. Smiling, jealous Odin took her by the throat, and with his very hands he stole her library and her life for his own. I always knew Odin was bad, but that's just... Useless, but... Barbaric? Heartless? That's Odin. In fact, we would do well to sit here in silence for the next few moments and reflect on Odin's capacity for cruelty. And so... Reflect longer. This chisel we seek. What is it? I'm glad you asked, actually. I have just the story for you. <laughs> there was a giant once named Thamu. A very giant giant. Who, despite his mountainous size, was without question the greatest stonemason this world had ever seen. Proud Thamu hoped to one day pass his vast knowledge onto his son. But young Hrimthur had the heart of a warrior. Perhaps the father had too much fear in him, or the son too little. Either way, a quarrel of theirs spiraled out of control, and the overworked stonemason, bonk, struck his son. Arimthur ran off into the night. Feeling shame and regret, Thamur chased after his son, but in his emotional state soon found himself wandering Midgard, lost and alone. Sadly, he caught the eye of the one person he didn't want to meet alone that night, so far from home. Thor. And what happened next? You'll see. Hammer fell, crushed a charming place famed for worshipping the Vanir god Njord. Thor always took credit for planning that one. The truth is, the sweaty claw bag just got lucky. Maybe Freya ought to have a look at the boy. No, I feel better now. I just needed to catch my breath. Where do we go next? Well, now that we've got the giant's chisel, we need to learn the travel room to Jotunheim, so we can carve it into that special gateway atop the peak, and open realm travel to the land of the giants. You don't know it? Alas, no. But the serpent did mention that the giants had entrusted that secret to Tyr. Isn't Tyr dead? Aye, but his hidden boat is very much in reach. The doors are beneath his temple, submerged in the lake for generations until our snake friend shifted his weight. There we shall find the fabled Black Rune of Jotunheim. We could also explore some more. We got that chisel now, and that vault isn't going anywhere. 
seems a shame to waste the boat. We shall see, boy. Okay, I know I saw something. I saw it too. Rhea did say the Jotunheim Realm Tower was missing from the lake. But maybe only kinda? Very strange indeed. Wow! It's like there was an entire city under the water. Aye, lad. A forgotten city. What was it called? Now, uh, well, I forgot. Well, I'm pretty sure you weren't talking to me back there. Anything you'd like to get off your chest, brother? I can assure you I'm unsurpassed in keeping confidences. Well, you know where to find me. And for the record, I'd already guessed you were Greek. Athena, dead giveaway. Here, boy. Another one. This one is Thrym. A frost giant king. Correct. A cunning one as well. Is that Mjolnir? Did he steal Thor's hammer? Aye. For a time. A lot of these seem to end with Thor killing them. Imagine that. <gasps> hey, if I'm a god, maybe I can fly. No, no! Gods too must stay on the path, I promise you. So what do you think, Mimir? What does Baldur want with us? Well, let's look at what we know. Baldur is Odin's finest tracker bar none. If he wants you, you have to consider the possibility that Odin wants you. And as for what Odin wants, on this I have some expertise. What could we have that Odin doesn't? He's like the king of gods. Of the Aesir, aye. But his reach is not unlimited. And where he cannot reach, he is preoccupied with going. He certainly tortured me enough about it over the years. Mimir, why don't you tell us the story of the giant that stole Thor's hammer? Happily, my boy. It involves your friend Freya, too, though I don't expect it's one she'd enjoy being reminded of. The giant was called Thrym, and he proved cunning enough to make off with Mjolnir while the thunder lummox slept. Sadly for Thrym, he didn't always think with his brain. Though he had robbed the greatest giant killer of his greatest weapon, he offered to trade it back to the Aesir in exchange for Freya as his bride. Now, at this point, Freya was married to Odin, and Odin, frankly, would have traded her for a sufficiently strong mead, but he saw an opportunity here. Thrym's palace was in Jotunheim, and only giants knew the way. By agreeing to the marriage, they'd have to escort Freya back to their realm. So, Odin coerced Freya into using her Sather magics to conceal Thor, so he could sneak along with her and infiltrate Jotunheim. When the hammer was produced as the wedding dowry, Thor revealed himself. He took back Mjolnir and wasted no time in smashing Thrym's skull, followed by every other giant present for the festivities. The only thing that put a stop to it was Freya, who wanted no part of this massacre. She cast a powerful spell that hurtled them both out of Jotunheim with no means of return. Odin was livid, hoping that Thor's foothold in Jotunheim would become his own, and oh, would he ever revenge himself upon Freya. What is the point of this story, Head? Well, for Thrym, the lesson would be to keep his priorities straight. For Freya, it's that doing good has a price.
for Thor, it's that no object of power makes you what you are. And if what you are is the biggest butchering bastard in the Nine Realms, nobody can take that away from you. trying to get to Jotunheim too? Aye. It ranks among his foremost obsessions. But that doesn't make any sense for me. Oh? When did I stop making sense? You're saying Balder tracked us down to find the way to Jotunheim. Now, before we knew Jotunheim is where we needed to go. That's crazy. Except for one thing. You are headed for Jotunheim. So he was right. I'm so pleased. Well then, clearly you've been listening. falls like that for great fires. The whole realm is a great fire. The source of fire itself. And all the sun and stars, if legend is to be believed. Should we believe? I mean, we're here, and we're not on fire. Not yet. Well, you know, I suppose it's cooled considerably since the dawn of creation, hasn't it? Niflheim isn't exactly ice these days, either. It's in the nature of things. Extremes are tempered by time. Fires burn colder, men grow old and grey, heads are chopped off and attached to belts. Such is life. Uh, okay, Mimir. Look here, another. This one's called Surter. Must be a fire giant. Aye, the first and original. He makes a flaming sword. A weapon of legend. He fights Thor and Odin, but is that the past or the future? Hmm, that may be a matter of perspective. Okay, tell me again how Odin knew we were going to Jotunheim before we did. Odin is extremely clever, you see. Nearly as clever as he thinks he is. And he's a collector of prophecies. If it's about the future, he adds it to his collection. Helps him style himself as all-seeing and all-knowing. But of course, the idea is control. Control of the future, control of his fate. He'd control every realm of every land in every world if he could. Every potential pocket of resistance, he seeks to eliminate. Even if you've never posed a threat before, he may think one day you might. So you see, it's not important how he knew before you did. It's important that he was right. It's nothing. He just said the boy seemed familiar to him. Me? That's impossible. No, I quite agree. Unless, perhaps, he refers to something yet to be. It is said that when Jormungandr and Thor battle at Ragnarok, their clash so violently shakes the Tree of Life that it splinters, casting the serpent backward through time, even before his own birth. What? That is madness. Well, I did say not to concern yourself. Alchemist, what needed finding? 
Here we go. I'm finally gonna get to see. Why is it so cold? I'm serious. This is unreasonable. I've seen enough. We can turn back now. left in Midgard? I mean, not counting the serpent from the future. Well, they did not take me into their confidence about that, Odin's convictions to the contrary. But I know this. If I'd spent the better part of 60 winters seeing my best and brightest cut down by Thor and that damn hammer, I might very well go home to lick my wounds. It's too bad. I was fond of every giant I ever met. So that's why they destroyed the bridges to Jotunheim. So the Aesir couldn't fall. Is that why there's no tower on the lake? I doubt it's a coincidence. So you think when we get to Jotunheim, we might find giants there? Anything's possible. Is there a story for the giant with the flaming sword? Suit the brave. Of course. We've spoken so much of frost giants. It's about time we instead met the most fiery giant of all. Back when Ymir first emerged from Ginungagop, it was Suot who followed next. He came from Muspelheim, the Fire Realm, bringing heat to the young cosmos, conjuring the sun from his primordial flame. But let's come back to that flaming sword, shall we? Suot the Brave forged his sword of flame for one purpose alone. To burn down Asgard when Ragnarok comes at last. His destiny is to fall at the hands of Thor and Odin. But in so doing, strike the blow that leaves their realm in ash and ruin. And from that destruction, the world can be born anew. Until then... Alone he waits in Muspelheim, never sleeping, ever honing his fiery blade. Brave, generous suit, who knows he lives but to his doom. All because he chooses to serve a grand cycle so much bigger than himself. To truly embrace your purpose and the patience and sacrifice it demands is to ensure your day will come. Do you think we'll be there? When that day comes? I've seen enough of war between the gods. But you, little brother, who can say... Hey. Another one here. It's Skadi. Mother liked her. The great huntress. That's right. Queen of the hunt, they called her. That's her father. And all the animals she hunted. He taught her well. In the last battle. Her father again. Both of them. In the snow. And they're still there. It's quite a story. Why is Odin so desperate to find a way into Jotunheim anyway? He's convinced the giants hold the key to changing his fate when Ragnarok comes. They are the Aesir's oldest enemies, after all. And it's their army that's supposed to do him in in the end. But more than that, he covets their gifts of prophecy. He wants to know what they know and see what they see. So much suffering could have been avoided if his insatiable curiosity was not so much stronger than his wisdom. What do you mean? Ah... Remind me to tell you why they call him the Lord of the Hanged. Dear boy, another one. Oh, look! It's Skull and Hati. The giant wolves who chase the sun and moon. Quite right, my boy. Where did they come from? How did they get up there? 
It's a long story, but we'll get to it. What's happening there at the end? They eat the sun and moon? And then everybody fights? I suppose that's one way to put it. So why do they call Odin the Lord of the Hank? That refers to a modest example of Odin's thirst for knowledge. The time he spent nine days a dead man. Aye. Hung himself by the neck from Yggdrasil's branches, put his spear through his own side, and bled down into the Well of Destiny. He roamed the realms of the dead and plundered the world tree of its secrets, until I think quite rightly it got fed up with him and sent him back to the land of the living. Did I not mention he was barking mad? Tell me about that giant lady with the bow. She was called Skadi, Queen of the Hunt. Her father was Thiotzi, who could take the shape of any wild creature, and taught Skadi how to hunt them all. From the ribs of pack beasts, she fashioned second feet, allowing her to glide upon the snow so no animal could evade her. She became a huntress beyond compare, even to any god. Odin himself wanted her for his bride believing she would bear him strong sons. But she spurned his affections, and for that insult, Odin vowed revenge. It was put forth that the Aesir were plagued by an eagle who would steal the precious golden apples of Idun. Not even the finest archer among the gods could bring it down. Odin knew that Skadi could not resist the temptation to prove herself superior, and so she joined the hunt. Skadi tracked the eagle as it flew where she alone could glide, and loosed an arrow from her unerring bow. When she collected her quarry, she found no eagle at all. But her own father, poor Theotzi, slain by his own daughter. She was overcome with grief and shame, for there is nothing nature so reviles as a child who kills their parent. Skadi succumbed to her fate as winter's blanket fell holding her father as the mountain held her in an embrace to last eternity. Well, that was sad. Aye. There aren't many happy endings for the giants, I'm afraid. Here's something I can't figure out. Odin wants to prevent Ragnarok. But the serpent's already been there and seen it. So hasn't he already failed? Fate's a tricky thing, lad. And Odin's just arrogant enough to think he can get the best of it. Fate is another lie told by the gods. Nothing is written that cannot be unwritten. On that, brother, you and the Old Father may just agree. Even if he can't prevent Ragnarok, he still hopes to learn enough details to influence the outcome. Remind me later to tell you about the wolves. <laughs> You're familiar with the tale of Skoll and Hottie, bringers of day and night. Oh yeah, the wolf giants. Aye. They were born of the arch-wolf Hroth Whitnir, a great nemesis of the Aesir gods. Odin captured them as pups and kept them in the kennels of Asgard to hold his foe at bay. But when the sun and moon grew mutinous and stood still, Odin put Skoll and Hottie to use. With his ancient magics, he cast the wolves to the heavens and they began their chase. And long shall they chase, but not endlessly, for it is foretold that someday Skoll and Hoti will catch and devour their prey. And that day shall be Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods. But Ragnarok is supposed to be Odin's doom, isn't it? Why would he set the wolves loose if it fulfills the prophecy? 
Precisely the question, lad. It's always about control. The wolves determine when Ragnarok begins, and now he controls the wolves. A battle fought on his timetable is a battle he better stands to win. Look here. Another. It says his name is Hrungnir. Mother told me about him. A giant warrior made of stone. Bits of him, yes. Looks like he was in a pretty big battle. Odin's there, Thor, even the World Serpent. Well, that's stretching it a bit. Oh. Thor must have smashed his head apart. See? But look! Hrungnir's body squished him. Idiot. Huh. <laughs> that part's true, at least. stories. When will you tell one that entertains? I beg your pardon? He just insulted you. Yeah, I got that. So you want a corker, do you? Very well, my brothers. I'll tell you the story of Brunia, the brawler. The real story. There was a huge battle, right? His shrine had him in the middle, fighting off Aesir. A pretty story, but no. Brunia, you see, was born with neither head nor heart. So the giants had to complete him with stone. He was strong, to be sure, but also a perfect simpleton. Odin met him wandering in Midgard one day, found him so amusing, so harmless, so gullible, that he invites him back to his palace in Asgard. There he gives Hrungnir his fill of mead, and goads him into all manner of boasts and antics, all for the amusement of the court. I was there. I saw the Aesir laugh as Hrungnir leapt upon his shield and swore he'd kill us all and take our womenfolk back to Jotunheim. Then Thor shows up. And does he laugh? Oh no. Thor takes one look at the drunken stone buffoon and brings down Mjolnir on his head so hard that he's got chunks of Hrungnir in his own skull to this day. Thor is so startled by the face full of rock. He doesn't notice Hrungnir's body topple right onto him with a sickening crunch. And again, the roars of laughter echo through the palace halls. That's an awful story, Mimir. Nothing like the one's mother told me. Let that be a lesson, my son. Truth is seldom so pretty as myth and legend. Another one here. Ah, you know this one, don't you? It's Thamu, the giant stone mason. Is he building a wall around Jotunheim? It was to be his masterwork. He only wanted to protect his people. Too bad the first part got burned. I prefer the last panel was burned. Such a senseless pity. Serpent. Yormi, to his close friends. He's so much bigger than I imagined. It's quite ridiculous. Oh, look. He bit Thor. Or will bite him. Looks like. Ragnarok. A long story. And they were on the way, dragging us into their little problems. Again, are we just leaving that there? I mean, just knowing we're gods makes me feel so much stronger. Maybe you feel a little too good right now. With power comes a big choice, lad. You can either serve yourself, or put your godhood in the service of others, like Tyr did. People really loved him, huh? Aye. A god of war, but one who fought for peace. Had a reputation for being heroic and lawful, using his power and knowledge to stop wars rather than start them. So there are good gods. Once in a moon, it's been known to happen, yes. This one mentions places I've never heard of. 
Seems Tyr really liked to travel. Tyr believed the mind, not might, was key to preventing war and chaos. And he also knew visiting other cultures would give him perspective staying in one place could not. While Odin always hoarded knowledge, guarding it jealously, Tyr was open and sharing with his learning and his wisdom. For this, mortals adored Tyr, showing their love by bringing him gifts the world over. So, whatever happened to Tyr? Odin came to regard him as a threat to his rule. He suspected Tyr of collaborating to aid the giants instead of helping to steal their secrets for the Aesir. The same thing he accused me of, frankly. Though in Tyr's case, I believe he was right. You think Tyr was helping the giants? I do. He felt responsible for the suffering visited upon them by Odin. I suspect he had something to do with helping them cover their tracks. The missing Jotunheim town. Correct. Whatever happened to it, I believe it could only have been done with Tyr and the giants working together. Where is this black woman? Why did you say Tyr felt responsible for what Odin did to the Giants? There was an incident shortly after the forging of Mjolnir, when Tyr arranged a diplomatic meeting between Odin and the Giant Kings. Well, this was when the Long War was young, when victory was still a thing dreamed of and the Jotnar might have tipped the balance between Aesir and Vanir. Odin had persuaded Tyr that the hammer was merely a deterrent, a means to broker peace from a position of strength. Tyr was hopeful to convince all parties they would prosper best through peace. He knew the giants were deeply concerned about the hammer, a super weapon in hands they did not trust. But they trusted Tyr. Tyr always believed the best in people, and taking Odin at his word and his desire for peace, he brought the Raven King to Jotunheim. Uh, from there, things unraveled quickly. The giants anticipated Odin's trickery and exposed his true agenda to spy and steal their secret wisdom. With magics, they expelled Odin from their realm and cursed him never to return. Frustrated, Odin visited his fury upon the giants of Midgard. Thor unleashed Mjolnir's might upon any giant he could find. None could stand against the tide of slaughter that followed. And at last, it seems, with Tyr's aid, they retreated. The tower disappeared, no giants could be found in Midgard, and no man nor god has set foot in Jotunheim since. Your father, Zeus? I finally understand! I'm dangling from the hip of the bloody ghost of Sparta! Do not call me that. Oh, don't mistake me, brother. From what I heard, the Pantheon had it coming. It's still a bit to take in. I knew you hate gods, but you really can't stay away from them, can you? You must say nothing to the boy. He must never know. Bollocks, brother. Respectfully, bollocks. He has to know. He'll never be whole without the truth. Look, I get it. You hate the gods. All gods. It's no accident that includes yourself, and it includes your boy. Did you see that? He feels that. He can't help what he is. He can't begin to help it because you haven't even told him. It's all connected, man. You will tell him nothing. Very well. Look here. Another. This one's called Emir. Mother tried to tell me this one, but I think I was too young. There is a touch of mystery about it. Are giants coming out of his armpits? Aye, and his feet as well. I think that might be Odin stabbing him. Aesir slaying Jotnar. Same as it ever was. Well, that's a sight no man should ever see. Thanks for that. Carve along that. Bowhead. Why did you not tell us Balder is the son of Freya? He is! It's shocking every time I hear it, and yet obviously I know it. 
When I think about Boulder and Freya... I... The mayor? Yes, lad. <laughs> Freya. How's that, brother? Hey, tell me Boulder's vulnerability. Boulder is blessed with invulnerability to all threats, physical or magical. Wait, what is happening? He is bewitched not to speak of what he knows. I am? I am! Oh, that's it precisely. I wonder how long that's been so. Since she had my head at her mercy, or back when I figured out Boulder's weakness. I'm here. Yes, lad. You just said you figured out Boulder's weakness. Did I? But Boulder is blessed with invulnerability to all threats, physical or magical. Ugh. Enough. This means there is a way. If he troubles us again, we will find it. Come here. You never told us what Magni and Modi had to do with Hrungnir. Oh, yes. Well, what happened after Hrungnir fell slain upon Thor was that nobody in the court could get the stone body off of him. Thor was no use at this point. His brain rattled, his breath shallow. But none of Odin's men were nearly strong enough to help. Then enter little Magni and Modi. No taller than shrubs. And while nobody but myself was looking, they flipped over Hrungnir's corpse and freed their father. Magni, being blonder, got all the credit. And Modi remained bitter about it from that day to the end, which I don't need to tell you about. I'm confused. I always heard that Baldur's mother was Frigg. Aye, Frigg. Well, that's more of a pet name, you see. It means beloved, something Odin called Freya after they wed. Out of affection at first, or so I like to believe, as things turned sour, it became a way to manipulate the truth. How so? Odin didn't want Freya, a Vanir goddess, getting credit for anything in Asgard. So anything worthy she accomplished was attributed to Frigg. Like being Baldur's mother. That's right. Freya was Baldur's mother all along. Bifrost crystals in your eyes. A loving gift from the giants. Since I used to do so much traveling between realms, they thought it would be more convenient for me than having a crystal I could lose. Did it hurt? No, because I wisely fortified myself with 16 cups of Billow Maiden's Ale. Got so inebriated I tried convincing the giants to put them in my nipples instead. <laughs> Almost talked them into it too. Can you imagine? Mimir of the Bifrost teats. <laughs> Ah, those were the days. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll stop now. Amir, why did you work for Odin if he's so horrible? It's my career! And if you mean to make your career as a counsellor to kings, he can't very well rule out petty maniacs. Available positions are scarce enough. My first master was a cruel piece of work as well, but I learned through him the enduring power of wit, which served me well with kings and gods alike. I couldn't have been much older than you when I started. A fairy king's errand boy and unofficial jester. A knight. My mates and I had the run of the forest. Good fellows, they called us. Knavish spikes to the last. We'd get up to all manner of mischief, making fools of the local mortals. But as long as our lord was kept amused, we were spared the consequences. Oh. Then one day he was not amused. And I saw fit to move on. 
Thankfully, the ages and roads travelled since then have turned me from that merry wanderer into the paragon of virtue you see before you today. Amir, how'd you come to be in these lands? Lad, there comes a time in every man's life when he changes his name and heads north to make a new start. If you live long enough to do this many times over, you might end up as far north as this place. By the time I arrived, I already knew Odin by his reputation, and so I set to demonstrate my worth by coming to him with something I knew he'd value. A mystic well of knowledge. Or rather, I should say, a well of water laced with enough mystic mushrooms to make a god see visions. Oh, he was rightly impressed. Can't say for sure what he saw that led him to try gouging out his own eyes, but I managed to restrain him before he finished the job. Then I persuaded him it has been his sacrifice made for an even higher form of sight to be bestowed. Blah, de blah, de blah, de blah. I used to think he never caught on. But the day he took my eye, I realized he had never been fooled. He knew I'd outwitted him, called the lesson wisdom, and hired me to make sure from then on I was on his side. And for a long, long time I truly was. Doesn't mean he didn't hold a grudge. get why you ever wanted to work for Odin. Back then, I was young enough to still be ambitious. The Aesir gods were as powerful a force as I'd come across, but they clearly lacked for strategy, focus, and sage counsel. All this could I faithfully provide. And so, a stranger from a far-off island found himself with Odin's ear, trusted as he trusted no one but himself. And with that kind of power, laddie, I must confess, there are perks. Yeah, but he's Odin. I never claim to be perfect, laddie. Only clever. And often too clever by half. So what'd you do to get Odin so mad at you? Well, for a long time my job was to enable Odin, and I was fucking excellent at it. Gradually, as I grew more to care about people and the world, my job became to contain him. To protect him from himself. By serving peace, I served his interests as well. That's the truth but he saw it as disloyalty. No longer trusting my motives, but not wishing to part with my brain or tongue, he bound me to a tree and adopted a new pastime of casual torture. Well, I'm glad we came along to cut off your head. Aye, lad. Lucky break, that was. Another one here. It says his name is Bergelmir. I think Mother said he was the king of the giants? Aye, that he was. And quite a bit more. Looks like he had a lot of kids. That, little brother, is what we call an understatement. He's dead, but nobody killed him. Do giants die from old age? They may, though it's rare among the legends. I have a question. If Ymir was the first giant, where did he come from? In the beginning, there was Ganungagop, the great boy. There were no realms yet, only primordial forces. There was fire, and there was ice, and there in the void they met and produced... Water? More than water. The mystic lifeblood of something entirely new. From this water, Ymir took form and became a being of pure creation and chaos, mother and father to all that came after. Even the Aesir? Aye. Every god, man and beast came first from Amir's flesh. Though it was the Aesir who thought themselves so superior that they should hold dominion over the rest of creation. It was Odin who took arms against his creator and spilled Amir's lifeblood with his spear. A necessary evil, he would say, to bring order to the realms. From Ymir's torn flesh, Odin would fashion the realm of Midgard for his own. 
called himself All Father, as if he was the creator and not the creator's destroyer. The small, covetous tyrant. Amir? Huh? Oh, sorry, my boy. Ah, uh, you know, I think at best we just end it there, actually. If I'm not mistaken, we've yet to discuss the tale of the giant Bergomir. Oh yeah, I remember his shrine. It looked happier than the other ones, mostly. It begins in an ocean of blood. Finally, a story worth hearing. If you remember, Emir, the first giant, was fatally stabbed by Odin. It's in his blood our story starts. Emir's magical guts poured out in a torrent so violent it threatened to flood all of creation. The Jotnar were unprepared, as the very last of them were washed away in the endless tide. Not just Emir, but all of giant kind faced extinction. And so would Odin's victory have been complete. But Emir's kind did not all perish that day. Staying afloat in the hollowed husk of a tree, the frost giant Bergomir endured, as did his lady wife. For weeks they sailed, until finally they came upon a new land. They called it Jotunheim. And there they would start anew. As father and mother, they would multiply exceedingly, and as king and queen, they worked to make Jotunheim a land where giants would know no master but themselves. Bergomir never sought revenge for Odin's slaughter. His vengeance was to live and prosper. He died at peace, a legion of his kin to mourn him. He would ever be known as Bergelmir the Beloved. Bergelmir the Beloved. Huh. I've never heard a story end that way. Not a true one, anyway. If you do, laddie. into the city. I'm not entirely sure, lad. It was abandoned long before Jormungandr came to town and flooded the place. Hmm. I wonder what it was like to live here. Can't believe the chain is the only thing holding him down. Odds are there's a bit of magic at play here as well. This is a dwarven stronghold, after all. Here, boy. Another one. Starkather. Wow. That's a lot of arms. That's fair to say. Six? Seven? Eight? Could he shoot four bows at once? More of a swordsman. He did only have the two eyes. It looks like Thor cut him down to size. It's what he does. Hey, with utmost certainty that I've never laid eye on a stranger set of objects in my life. How are Brock and Sindri supposed to build with... whatever they are? Don't count the dwarves out, lad. They're right pricks, but they're resourceful. They once made an unbreakable chain out of little more than a cat's footstep and bird spit. That doesn't even make sense. Well, that's the legend. If you wanted sense, you shouldn't be talking to a severed head. Okay. What about the giant with eight arms? Starkath the Mighty, he was called. If the giants ever had anything so organized as an army, Starkath would have been their general. An opinion, in retrospect, I should have kept to myself. But no, as Odin's advisor, I kept him advised. And having bent his will towards Starkath's doom, there was no dissuading him. But even Thor wasn't stupid enough to take on Starkath on his own. No. Instead, the Aesir set forth slanders upon Starkath's name, branding him throughout the realms as a monster to be feared. They said he abducted an elf queen who killed herself rather than be ravished by the giant. Lies, of course, but you're too young for her story. In the end, even the Vanir gods and the armies of Midgard were roused to the cause. 
They surrounded Starkath, showered him with arrows until he was brought to his knees. He surrendered, hoping by trial he could clear his name. Thor took advantage and ripped off one of Starkath's arms, which only made it easier to sever another and another until he was satisfied. Relieved of six arms and too much blood, Starkath perished upon the battlefield. Ah, I regret it to this day, you know. I told myself there was nothing I could do, but I wish I'd tried. Ah, Niflheim. Not sure why anyone would want to come here, but here we are. It smells bad. What is this stuff? This mist is cursed. Cursed? Quite right. Safe to breathe for a time, but it'll kill if we linger. Just one more reason to love Niflheim. If you're thinking about hurling us all into the void, I hope you're quite sure. Wasn't it your idea? Find our own path, right? Bollocks. I wanted to fly again. Yes, that's a terrible pity. I must have convinced him that following you to Jotunheim would bring his cure. Lies, I'm sure. Why did Mistletoe break the spell? Vanir magic is powerful, but its rules are slippery and elusive. I'm sure it makes sense if you're a witch. Oh, but it's also bloody tragic. Balder was the greatest gift Odin granted Freya, the one thing she treasured from their marriage. She only hoped to spare him pain and spare herself loss, but such impulses can lead good parents to make terribly stupid decisions. Before we return to Midgard, I should warn you, more time has passed than you want to realize. The snowfall that began when you slew Balder, it's become something else. The stuff of omens. Omens? For the coming of winter? Not just any winter, but a great winter to span three summers. And when it's done, Ragnarok begins. Ragnarok? From snow? Ah, snow. Lots more snow. And then the end of the bloody world, in that approximate order. Another prophecy? No, brother. Prophecy doesn't expect this for a hundred more winters at least. You've changed something. Prophecy didn't count on you. Vimir, what did you call Mother? Laufey the Just? Did you know her? I never had the pleasure. Laufey was a rumor in the halls of Asgard. A giantess warrior who thwarted many an Aesir god's plans. Freeing those who they would enslave, feeding those who they would starve, generally making a nuisance of herself in the most noble of ways. Thor was terribly frustrated he could never find her to fight. Once my imprisonment began, I could only wonder what became of her, and who she would turn out to be. Yours is quite a singular lineage, lad. <laughs> Maybe you know Brock and Sindri. Or the Huldra brothers. Well, who doesn't? They're quite famous, or infamous, depending on your point of view. They crafted Mjolnir, you see. Thor's hammer? The Aesir's greatest murder weapon? The bane of giant kind? They made Thor's hammer? I didn't think they'd like the Aesir. Oh, I should say not. But this was long ago, and they were eager to make a name for themselves. Rather overdid it with that one, methinks. It was long ago, and they were eager to make a name for themselves. Rather overdid it with that one, methinks. Hang on. Mimir, you called Brock and Sindri the Holger brothers? Aye. But they're dwarves, aren't they? Aye. And Holger are sprites of the forest? Aye. 
beautiful seductive sprites of the forest. So why would you call Brock and Cindy the Holger brothers? Oh, well, I now realize this would be a wholly inappropriate story for young and innocent ears. Whatever. Hey, if I'm a god, maybe I can fly. No, no! Gods too must stay on the path, I promise you. Look, don't be mad, but I've seen those blades of yours before. They were under the house when I was hiding. Is that why you never let me down there? Where did they come from? They are my burden, from a life that is behind me. Well, they're in my life too now, and I'd like to hear that story. Those days are dead. To relive them is... needless. How can it be needless if it's the truth? One day, you will understand. I'll take your word for it. Brothers, there's another thing I must let you know, from the time you were away in Jotunheim. Well, tell us then. It concerns Freya. She paid me a visit. What did you tell her? What little I know about where Odin may have kept her Valkyrie wings. Seems she's rather bent on reclaiming her warrior spirit. I'm afraid the cycle of vengeance may not be so easily broken. Know any more stories, Mimir? Of course, laddie, and yours for the asking. But I prefer the boat. In here is... distracting. This is Rota, accuser of the slain. I thought all the Valkyrie did that. Not exactly, lad. Although that is what they're most famous for, and by far their greatest responsibility. You've seen what happens to the dead without the judgment of the Valkyries. Hellwalkers. That's right. Rota, Gunnar, Skuld. Without them to clean up the aftermath of battle, hell overflows with souls meant for Valhalla. A sorry state of affairs. Rota must be beside herself. This, my friends, is Kara. Now, Valkyries are volatile by nature, but Kara, the lass's wild storm personified. A wild storm? Aye, calm and collected. Then the air would shift and the fury of our storm would unleash. It was beautiful in a way, assuming you could find proper shelter. Her tears would cleanse the blood-soaked battlefields. This is none other than Gerdrifold, the master of arms in Valhalla. Responsible for arming and training Odin's in Heriar. His what? His army come Ragnarok. The entire reason Valhalla exists, you see. The Ainheriar wait in the Great Hall endlessly, feasting, drinking, and fa- Ah, uh, fornicating themselves silly. Once Ragnarok begins, Odin calls them into service to fight on his behalf. Gerdry Fool had her hands full training that lot. Ah, Gondul. Beautiful Gondul. And? Huh? That's it? Beautiful Gondul? No story or anything? Uh, oh, sorry, lad. The sight of Gondul always took my breath away. Gondul had a silver tongue, a sharp wit, and struck a figure so stunning it literally drove men insane. Odin forbid her from setting foot in Midgard after a time, as insanity is not a welcome trait in Valhalla. Gunnar, mistress of war. After any conflict, big or small, she would be first on the scene, sussing out the worthy spirits for a free trip to Valhalla. A gruesome task, but she took great pride in it. Any conflict? Impossible. It's true. She had help from her sisters, of course, but Gunnar was always first to arrive. Her judgment of the fallen was unparalleled, and an invaluable resource to Odin. She was one of his favorites. Well, well. Hilda, mistress of battle. She and Odin got on quite well, actually. Her and the other Valkyries, not so much. She 
She would spend most of her time here in Midgard observing discord between the living and sewing some up herself from time to time. She lived for conflict. Some say she was conflict personified. I wonder what will become of her now that she's free. Old Rune, once the daughter of a powerful chieftain. She fell defending him during a reaver attack. Old Rune was escorted to Valhalla, where she chose to devote her afterlife to the pursuit of knowledge above all else. Quite unusual behaviour amongst the constant drinking and feasting of her fellow Valhallian denizens. How'd she end up with Valkyrie? Odin. He saw a kindred spirit in Olrun's single-minded pursuit of knowledge. He appointed her as a Valkyrie's resident historian. Ah, here we have Air, the healer. A Valkyrie healer? Strange. Air was strange, as a matter of fact. Very quiet, very calm. Where her sisters were violent rapids, air was a gentle stream. She healed the wounds of both mortals and gods, and even a certain all-knowing sage who once drank too much and fell off a mountain. Ugh, not my proudest moment. You never told me what happened with the stonemason's son. Rimthur, son of Thamur. After completing his father's masterwork, the Great Wall of Jotunheim, I thought of nothing but making the Aesir pay for their crimes against the giants. Once, he longed to fight Thor, but tragedy had brought wisdom to Rimthur and cunning. He observed that Asgard's walls were half-built and shoddy, for no Aesir god could be bothered with such tiresome labor. So Finkur adopted the guise of an ordinary man and made the Aesir an offer. He would build them majestic new walls, and if he couldn't build them within two turns of the season, they would owe him nothing for his labours. And if he succeeded, he asked only for an audience with the goddess Freya. Odin agreed, knowing the task was impossible, but intrigued by the stranger. Finkur made short work of it, of course. He had the benefit of his father's training and the aid of a magical stallion for fetching stones. Odin was not happy to find himself on the losing end of the wager, but he seemed to uphold his end of the bargain. Freya was sent to meet the mason, and to her surprise, he wanted only to whisper something in her ear. That being done, he made his way out of Asgard, and when he found Thor awaiting him at the gates of Midgard, he knew he had been double-crossed. But he didn't care, because his plan was complete. It was? What did he say to Freya? Only she could say for certain, but I've had many moons to work it out. Harimthur knew that Freya loathed the Aesir, despite her marriage to Odin, and I believe he gave her the secret to Asgard's defences. Some weakness he may have built in, structural or magical, which I expect will be exploited come Ragnarok when Surtur arrives to burn Asgard to ash, if not sooner. Look. Wait, so Freya is the Valkyrie Queen? She never told us. You never told us. Explain yourself, Head. Or are you bewitched again? Not at all. Freya was Queen of the Valkyries at one point. Part of her marriage dowry included overseeing the Valkyries themselves. As a powerful Vanir goddess, they revered her. I never knew how much until now. 